in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. chapter 2 and James just read verses 5 through 11 and that's our text for today so we're continuing our study on on Jesus his miracles and his parables and uh, today we're gonna look at this miracle of the incarnation uh, so we've been working through these parables working through these miracles of Jesus and I want us to focus today on something that maybe we don't consider a miracle but but is exactly that which is the incarnation of Jesus when Jesus the eternal Son of God became man. Now we don't think of that as typically as a miracle, but we should. In fact, like uh, as one pastor says this, the incarnation is the central miracle of Christianity. It's the most grand and wonderful of all things God has ever done. So I want us to meditate on this miracle of God becoming a man and what it means for us. Now, I don't know about you, I think we all have our different likes and our dislikes. One of the things I enjoy doing in my spare time is watching sports, specifically like football, basketball, a couple others. Um, I, I, so, so I enjoy those things. Some of you are sports fans, others of you are not. Whatever your area of interest though, whether it's sports or whether it's music or whether it's art, we all appreciate greatness. We all appreciate greatness. Often topics of conversations are who is the greatest athlete of all time, the greatest basketball player of all time, maybe the greatest composer, the greatest artist, the greatest renaissance painter. Those are discussions that we have around the water cooler. Now instead of the water cooler, we, we have those discussions perhaps on the internet. But we do appreciate greatness. And in the basketball world, there is this discussion over who is the greatest player of all time. Uh, so I won't bore you with all of the details, but it centers around two individuals, really. One from my generation, Michael Jordan. He was a Chicago Bull. Uh, my generation thinks or believes in general that Michael Jordan is the greatest basketball player of all time. Sometimes missing a couple others that came before Jordan that may well have been the greatest too, but, but typically this conversation centers around Jordan, all right, and from the 90s, late 80s and 90s, and then this current generation, uh, LeBron James, okay? Those are, that's really where the discussion is, who's the, who's the greatest basketball player of all time. We'll leave the decision to somebody else, but I, I've never, because I was a fan of Michael Jordan, I've never forgotten his Hall of Fame speech. And I'd encourage you to, to, to search that up later and read it for yourself, or, or you can even pull up the video and watch it. Um, but for somebody that I respected so much as a basketball player, to watch him speak and to hear the content of his speech, it was to say that it was disappointing is an understatement. You see, Jordan was a, a fear, he was fiercely competitive. In fact, he has been called pathologically competitive, which isn't really a compliment. One of the things that fueled Jordan was that he kept track of every single slight, even from his childhood. And he internalized it, and he used it as fuel to drive him in his sport. So even at his Hall of Fame induction, at the same time he's, he's being inducted in the Hall of Fame with a couple other greats like David Robinson. And to contrast their speeches, right, Robinson was so filled with gratefulness and thanks for, for other people that had sacrificed and invested their time for him to be there. It's a time when you give great thanks to others. Jordan's speech was really mostly about him. And once again, he used this opportunity. Instead of really giving thanks, he used the opportunity to kind of bring up old slights, things that had happened against him. So instead of seeing, I'll give you one example, instead of seeing all the ways that his high school coach prepared and propelled him to be the athlete and the basketball player that he was, he couldn't get past the idea that his coach put him on junior varsity his sophomore year. 
couldn't, he never got past that. Something he still brings up. And uh, he brought that up in his Hall of Fame speech instead of thanking his coach. When in fact his coach doing that, when you talk to his coach and why they did those things, his coach doing that, if Jordan would have been on the varsity team his sophomore year, he would have sat the bench. Instead, he had him play junior varsity so where he could play and get lots of minutes. It developed him, it prepared him for his junior year when he would lead the team. Make him ready. So Jordan's speech, it left many people disappointed. It tarnished the vision many had of him. Interesting, though, that players said this was the real Michael. They knew him. They knew what he was like. So what made him so great also made him really hard to stand to be around in any other venue. Pathologically competitive, harboring every slight, note-taking, right? Longing for revenge, like waiting for the day when he's going to be able to get back at somebody for something he views that they did. And it may be a way to win games. It may be a way to attain greatness in some aspect. But it's really a terrible way to live. And when the games have finished and they finish for everybody, that attitude's still there. And so now all you have left is these slights, these things you're carrying around. And you can't help but notice, okay, when you read the text that James read for us today, I can't help but notice the polar opposite in Jesus. Okay, both in the way that, that Jordan carries himself, but even if we're going to get honest, like the way I carry myself. Okay? Who, though he was and is God, Jesus became a servant. But Jesus humbled himself. He didn't cling to his rights. He didn't cling and hold on to those things, though he could have, but he didn't. Our text, this Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, if you haven't turned there, turn there. Um, it's, it's, possibly that it's, it's possible that it's a hymn. Before it became written in Scripture and, and part of the canon, it's quite possible a lot of writers believe this was a hymn that the early church sang before it was written down. And you can see the poetry in it, right? Um, even though it's translated from another language, you can see the poetry in this, this passage. It's, it was a way then, if it is a hymn, it was a way for the early church to sing their theology of Jesus to teach and remind everybody what he had done. He was in the form of God. He didn't think that equality with God was something that was to be grasped, but he made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant. But now that Jesus is highly exalted, and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, right? It drives home the miracle of the incarnation of, of God becoming a man and, and writing to Christians Paul wants us to find our identity, our worth in the right place. Our identity shouldn't be defined by the things that we amass, even the, the accomplishments that we make. Those are good things. We can celebrate them, but our identity shouldn't be wrapped up in those things. Our worth and, and our identity should be found in a single place. Where do we find it? Well, we find it in Christ. And Paul, he's teaching us then about this, this incarnation so that we in turn can have the same mindset as the one that we confess to follow. So what do we learn from the incarnation? Well, here's what we learn. Here's the first thing. Paul wants you to know, he wants you to not forget the pre-existence of Christ. The pre-existence of Christ. Look at verse 6. He was in the form of God. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Another translation, uh, did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. We, we typically celebrate the incarnation, the arrival of Jesus. We celebrate it at Christmas. because It's the birth of Jesus in a manger. But it's important for us to understand, and Paul is pointing it out here, that Jesus' birth, his arrival here on earth, was not his beginning. It wasn't his beginning. In fact, Jesus existed pre-incarnation. Pre, prior to his arrival, Jesus already was. In fact, what the Bible makes clear is that Jesus has always existed as part of the Trinity. This isn't something that Jesus attained because of his life. Jesus has always been something part of the Trinity. Before the manger, Jesus was in the form of God. Before being in the womb, Jesus was in the form of God. 10,000 years before Joseph and Mary were born, Jesus was already in the form of God. A 
millennia before the world and the universe was created, Jesus was already in the form of God. So, so then that's an important question. What does Paul mean by the form of God? What does he mean by that? And, and simply, it is, you can just, as simple as I can put it, it's this way. However you define God, Jesus has it. Okay? So everything that God the Father is, Jesus was prior to his arrival on earth as a human, right? And he was, and he is now. So God the Father is all-knowing, so is Jesus. God the Father is all-powerful, so is Jesus. God had no beginning, same with Jesus, right? So in the form of God is really one word in the, in the original language there, and it means to have the outward and the inward shape of an object. So Paul is saying that Christ existed prior to his arrival on earth and that Jesus was and is completely God. And so here's something important to to drive home. So that any church, any religion, though it claims like Christianity or it claims to be and believe the same thing, if it teaches different about the character and the nature of Jesus, then that church is not teaching correctly on who Jesus is. So, so this is one of the things that when people talk about, oh, we believe the same things. Okay, it's important to define terms. And this is one of the questions that really gets to the heart of Christianity. Well, what do you believe about Jesus? Well, I believe Jesus is the Christ. Okay, well, what else do you believe about Jesus? Is he the Son of God? Yes, okay. Has Jesus always existed as the Son of God? Is he the eternal Son of God? Or is this is something he attained? And, and now we're getting into some differences. And just to make, just to bring up one example, you can... You can compare what Paul teaches here about Jesus eternally existing, and you can compare that with, like, the teaching, let's say, of the Mormon church. Now, there's been this great movement. I don't know if you've been reading this week. The the Mormon church is now asking not to be called or referred to as Mormons, but the full, like, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And they have made this big push to become mainstream. And it's quite easy for us to say, well, we all believe the same thing, but we don't. We don't. So some, we use some of the same words, but let's get to the heart of the matter. Has Jesus always been God? Well, no. Well, you find out that the, the, the LDS church teaches differently. They teach that Jesus and Satan share the Father as a parent, that they were both sexually begotten or reproduced by the Father and a goddess. They're like spirit brothers, and one of them chose a different direction than the other. So that's fine. You can teach that, but you can't say that we both believe the same thing. Does that make sense? We're not all like believing the same thing here. Jesus, uh, uh, Jesus inherited the powers of the Godhead, right? More on that in a little bit here, but this is the teaching of the LDS Church. The late president of the Mormon Church, Gordon Hinckley, when asked if the Jesus of the LDS Church and the Jesus of Christianity are the same, he went on record saying that Jesus of Mormonism and Jesus of Christianity are not the same because of all these reasons that I've listed and more. Paul removes any doubt, though, of the idea of Jesus attaining deity, which is what the LDS Church would teach, and which is that other religions would teach as well. Paul goes on to say in verse 6, look at it, Jesus did not think that equality with God was something to be grasped. He says it's about Jesus. He didn't have to grasp it. He didn't have to try to attain to be God because it was already his. It was already his, the preexistence of Jesus. When you start talking about Jesus being the eternal son of God, that everything that has always been true of God is true of Jesus, then you start separating Christianity from other religions. Virtually, now I won't say no one, but most people don't deny that Jesus existed in some capacity. But many, many people say words that sound good, but deny that he is the eternal son of God, that he's been eternally God, even down to some of our founding fathers. 
Okay, so this is where like when you, people talk about like it being a Christian nation, well, let's, let's kind of define terms here because some of our founding fathers, they espouse a religion, a deism, but if you start like getting down to their writings about, okay, but is Jesus the eternal son of God? Well, no, so one example would be Thomas Jefferson. Something else to research this week, research the Bible that he kind of copied and pasted together, the Jefferson Bible. He removed any and all traces of the miracles of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus, because he believed that Jesus was a good person, but not that Jesus was God, or that he'd been eternally God. And so, while this seems like a just one point, it's just the pre-existence of Christ, I'm telling you, this is what separates Christianity from so many other religions. It should be pointed out that Paul here is not making a like a defense. He's just simply stating what's true, Right? He's simply stating what is accepted fact by the early church. Other places in Scripture, they testify to the fact that Jesus has always been God. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Listen to what, what it says here. You can see it on the screen. Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things. Okay, through whom also he created the world. So we learn something here. We see it in other places too. Not only did Jesus exist before the creation of the world, Jesus is the one who created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God. And he is what? He is the exact imprint of God's nature. He's the exact imprint. And he upholds the universe by the, world of his, by the word of his power. Wow. One more for you. John 17, verse 5. And now, Father, this is Jesus' prayer. Now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. And over and over again, if you read the Bible, you find the Bible attests to this fact that Jesus always has been and always will be fully God. And Paul makes that crystal clear. So does the testimony of the rest of Scripture. So our king was and is God. All right, that's the first thing. Here's the second thing that we notice in this text about the incarnation, the arrival of Jesus. We, verse 7, we notice the, the humanity of Christ. The humanity. This is the, the miracle. He was born in the likeness of men. Verse 8, he was found in human form. So we've already established that he's fully God. But he did not cling to this equality with God. So somehow, in a miraculous way, which is why this is a miracle, why one we should celebrate, in a miraculous way, without diminishing the fact that he's fully God, without diminishing his holiness and his perfection, Christ, the creator, took on the form of his creation. One writer says, like, the infinite became finite emptied himself by, by taking the form of a servant. The depths of that statement, if you think about it, they're really hard to comprehend because that, that means that God who always was and always has been in taking on human flesh, he's born and now he, he grows in wisdom. Well, how does that work? I don't, I don't know how that works. It means that God whose eyelids have never closed, close in sleep, who's never wearied or exhausted, now in, in human form, we're told in the text that he, there's times when Jesus is exhausted or when he's weak in the wilderness. He even still has a body after the resurrection. We see Jesus on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection and in the upper room. And he has a human heart that's troubled and a soul that is very sorrowful, even unto death in Matthew chapter 26. So Jesus, we see, he is human in every way except sin. So he is God in every way, and now as he arrives on earth, he is now human in every way, with the one exception, without sin. The only, he is the only one. What's, what's, the, what's the, the sin about being proud and arrogant? Well, why is this such a sin? Because what you're always overlooking is the help that others give, right? Or, you know, you talk about your accomplishments as a, as a composer, as a, as, a, as a musician, as an athlete. Those things are great, but did you grow your brain? Yeah, maybe you developed your talent, but did you, did you grow the arm that plays the violin like that? Right? Did you grow your brain that's able to, to compose things in that such a way? Well, no, of course not. You, do you control the breaths you take? Not really. 
right? We are always like relying on somebody else, but Jesus, Jesus is the only one to ever walk the earth who was worthy of all of the praise, the only one worthy of all of the adoration and the worship the world could give, but Jesus never demanded it. What other king can claim this? So we must understand as we're talking about this incarnation, the humanity of Christ, and we must understand the profound humiliation Jesus endured in taking human form. And we'll, we'll talk about more on that in a minute, but Isaiah chapter 6, if you'll turn there real quick in the Old Testament, I want to read just a few verses for you. Yeah, Isaiah chapter 6, start in verse 1. It gives us further insight into the, the glory that Jesus set aside, the glory that he emptied himself of as he became a man. Chapter 6, verse 1. So think about this and imagine, imagine this vision and seeing this. In, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. This is, this is King Jesus. And the train of his robe had filled the temple, and above him stood the seraphim, and each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The foundations of the thresholds, they shook, they shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, here's Isaiah talking now, I said, woe is me, for I am lost. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah, he felt when he got a glimpse of Jesus in all his glory, that glory that Jesus set aside. He didn't set apart any of his, his deity, but the glory that Jesus set aside as he came to earth. Isaiah gets a glimpse of that glory, and he feels as if he's being pulled apart at the joints. He has no capacity to describe what he sees. Well, Christ laid aside all of that outward glory when he came to earth. It would have been impossible for anybody to approach Jesus. We get a glimpse of that glory of Jesus when he's on the Mount of Transfiguration. We get a glimpse of that glory in the miracles he performed. He set aside some of his other attributes as well while in human form, but let's make, let's make it perfectly clear. Jesus never set aside his deity, his equality with God when he became man. Well, why did Jesus come? Why did he come to earth? Why did he take on human form? The answer is simple, to save his people from their sins. The Son of God came to earth, but not to demand, not to, not to demand, but to serve. He refused to cling to what was rightfully his. He was and is God. But at the incarnation, Jesus became permanently human too. See, Jesus' humanity, it isn't something that he shed after the crucifixion. He's not now just a spirit. That humanity, we know the risen Lord, they, they saw him afterwards. They touched his scars. You will too in heaven. He took on him the form of a servant, inwardly and outwardly. I was reading a while back the stories of the Spartans and the stories they tell each other of, hero, of heroism and, and courage and the way they teach their, their, their young. But listen, reading about the way they view the immortals, listen to what they write about their view of deity. And how there's only so much like the immortals can teach them. So this Spartan declared that in all other questions one may look for wisdom to the gods, but not in matters of courage. Said, what have the immortals to teach us there because they cannot die? Their spirits are not housed as ours in this, this body, indicating the body and the flesh. But these Spartans, they knew nothing of the, the God-man who did in fact die. The God-man, had he, had he not become man, he couldn't die in our place. But had he not been God, he would have just simply stayed in the grave like everybody else. But he's the God-man, dying in our place, defeating death, rising again, providing a way of victory over death for every one of us that calls on his name. Jesus didn't diminish his deity. In addition to being God, Jesus took to himself humanity. Here's the third thing in the text. Notice the humility of Christ, and we began to touch on this, but notice it here, verse 8. He humbled himself. Well, how did he humble himself? Because he became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now, let's think about Jesus' arrival 
and then this humbling of death. Surely, like, like the creator of, of everything, the king of kings would come to earth and maybe like a fiery chariot, this great arrival like this. Surely he would come with this great, vast army. But how did Jesus arrive? Well, he arrived at earth's, or at, at, at life's most, most fragile point. He was born in a trough where animals feed. The God who, who knows all, has all power, he entered the world through his mother's birth canal. He needed to be nursed. He was capable of pain and tears and nightmares. Unlike the song we sing, the carol we sing at Christmas, the little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. No, he cried. He was an infant. He never sinned. So no tantrums, no spats, but he cried. He was hungry. He was scared. Nightmares. What do you think? How did this work, the God-man? When did he start realizing as a young one the cross was coming? You know, when my kids were little, the nightmares are scary, right? And, and their one consolation in a nightmare is, is you hug them, you kiss them. It was just a dream. It's not actually happening. But what if, what if your nightmare is about the cross? I mean, it is coming. Right? So, so Jesus, the God who knows all, who has all power, he humbled himself and he took on life at its most fragile point, the form of a servant. He became obedient to death, the death of the cross. His humility, it took him all the way to the crucifixion, a death that is reserved for slaves, reserved for what society considered the basis, the least deserving, a di died that we might have new life. Another hymn that we sing or carol that we sing at Christmas talks about this reality that Christ the Lord is born today death and darkness they surely tremble but light has come to all the people the lion he comes to crush the serpent but he comes a lamb a lowly servant let the earth rejoice so come and lift your voices God has sent his greatest treasure he has shown his love in greatest measure sending Christ to bleed and suffer, purchasing our joy forever. Let the earth rejoice, so come and lift your voices. He could have insisted upon his rights. As he's dying on that cross, the power that is available to Jesus as the world mocks, the hosts of heaven just waiting, like, give us the word, Lord. Give us the word, King, and we will end everyone. He could have insisted upon his rights, but instead, the humility of Christ, he became obedient to death every step of the way, humbling himself, crucified, not for his sins, but for Jason's sins, for your sins. And as it starts to sink in here, the humanity, the humility of the pre-existent Jesus, remember how Paul starts this. Let this mind be in you. Like, let this mind be in you. Right? This, this is what we have to think about. Salvation, it doesn't mean bigger houses and, and cars and promotions. It means take up your cross and follow me. Not to get saved, but you are now a Christian, and so follow me this way by taking up your cross and following me. It doesn't always then have to be about our rights. This is who we follow. This is who we are. Now that we know this, we're to live like it. Act like the child of God that we are. We don't, we don't let this mind, we don't live this mindset so that God will see that we're worthy and save us. God has saved you, Christian. Now let this mind be in you that you, like your king, serve. We're called, we're called to live like our Savior. Somebody else has said it. Humility is not thinking of yourself like thinking less of yourself. It's not like, oh, yeah, oh, no, I'm just not really good and, humble. and Humility is thinking of yourself less. Like, how do you know when your humility is kind of slippery, right? Like, when you get to the point, you're like, I'm feeling pretty humble. You probably, you probably missed it, like on the other side, right? Hey, you know, it's, I think it's one of my spiritual gifts. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty good about it. I don't like to tell a lot of people. But how, how do you, how do you, but I'm going to tell you, right? How, how, how do you, how do I know humility is not thinking less of yourself? No, tearing yourself down. That's not humility. Humility is simply thinking of yourself less. You're not the central character. 
God in his glory is. And the humility of, of Christ is simply that. Like we're to, we're to call and live in that way so we can put away the slights that are real. And we do have rights to things, but we don't have to make that be everything in life for us. We can follow our king who set aside those rights to serve and to sacrifice. We're called to live like our savior. We're called to humility and service and sacrifice while we are strangers and sojourners here. That's the way the Bible describes us as Christians on the earth, pilgrims, sojourners, strangers. But a day is coming, and that's how Paul ends this, verses 9 through 11. I mean, this is kind of a tragic story if we end with verse 8, but Paul ends with the exaltation of Christ. The story doesn't end with Jesus' death and crucifixion. Therefore, God... After he took on himself the form of the servant, right, Jesus, as he did that, and he became obedient even to the death, the death of the cross, now God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, under the earth. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So he was ridiculed. And he was mocked by men, and his name was mocked. But God has now exalted him, and he's given him a name that is above every name. As one pastor says, Jesus will reign, and the Father will see to it. Every knee will bow. Every knee. The question is, will it be out of adoration upon entrance into heaven? Or will it be about under compulsion before eternity in hell? Even Satan and his minions will confess that Jesus is Lord. They will on that last great day. We know how the story ends. It ends with the exaltation of Jesus. And so here's my challenge to you, my word to you. Don't wait. Don't wait to choose sides. Uh, In mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis warns about the person who thinks they can just, oh, I'm not really sure about Jesus if he's Lord, but I tell you what, I'm going to wait till he comes back like he promises, and when he comes back, then I'll decide. But C.S. Lewis, he warns about that in mere Christianity. Let me read it to you. God is going to invade, but what is the good of saying you're on his side when you see the whole natural universe melting away like a dream? It will be God without disguise, something that is so overwhelming that it will strike either irresistible love or irresistible horror into every creature. But it will be too late to choose your side. There is no use saying you choose to lie down when it's become impossible to stand up. So now is the time to decide. And God has exalted him. The earth will receive its king. Jesus reigns. He is Lord. He is the pre-existing king who humbled himself, who took upon himself the form of a servant. Now let this mind be in you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we come to your word today, we are humbled by the magnitude of who Jesus is, his greatness, his power, never setting that aside. And we thank you for that, Lord. We praise you for that. We confess, Lord, the ways in which we we keep record and track of wrongs and and rights being violated. And Lord, see that, that sometimes you call us to set those things aside. And you're only calling us to do what Jesus did. So we pray for grace to do that, to lean into relationships that are difficult, to cover a multitude of sins because we love. We pray for that today. As the instruments play, here's your time to speak with God, and maybe you're here and you've been on the fence and you're like, I'm going to wait till Jesus returns, but you're seeing that that's too late at that point. Today is the day of salvation. So maybe for you, your prayer is, Father, save me through your son Jesus. Forgive me for my sins and save me today. Maybe you're here, though, and God is challenging you about having the mindset of Christ, living to serve, humbling yourself so that God might be exalted. So maybe that's your prayer today. As the instruments play, here's your time to speak with God.